Uh, Chris, we're lucky to have you here, but Dr. Rule, let me turn it over to you to uh, give the formal introduction. Okay, well, we'll welcome uh, Professor Christopher Basford this week. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in history from the College of William and Mary, a master's degree in American diplomatic history from Ohio University, and a PhD in modern European history uh, from, from Purdue University, obviously. Uh, a deep historical background. Um, deep, yes. Between his master's and doctoral degrees, uh, Professor Basford served five years uh, on active duty in a U.S. Army field artillery unit uh, with tours in Germany and Korea. Uh, he, like many of our speakers in this series, is a true soldier scholar like our subject. Uh, professionally, he's been director in the history of theory and nature of war at the U.S. Marine Corps Command and Staff College, associate professor of national policy issues at the U.S. Army War College and returned to the Marine Corps as a concepts and doctrine analyst for Marine Corps Combat Developments Command, where he wrote, and he'll be talking about this later in his discussion today, some of his publications that he authored, um, Marine Corps doctrinal publications and Marine Corps warfighting publications. Uh, then he joined the National War College from 1999 to 2012 as a professor of strategy, and currently he's now uh, on the faculty of NDU at the Joint Special Operations Masters of Arts program, JSOMA. Uh, as a Clausewitz scholar, just briefly, um, first is the seminal work, really, uh, Clausewitz in English. Uh, I just wanted to give a brief quote from Elliot Cohen. Uh, on the importance of this publication. Uh, he wrote in a review for Foreign Affairs, in the course of an illuminating discussion, Basford says a great deal about Anglo-American strategic thought in the modern period. An interesting study that has something to say to many audiences, including those concerned with the state of contemporary military thought or intellectual history. In addition to uh, many valuable new insights into terminology, how we understand Clausewitz by understanding the language of Clausewitz, um, the work also provides important insights into how Clausewitz affects strategic thinking in the, in the English-speaking world, which is very important. Perhaps I'll cut myself a little shorter there. Oh, no, I'm um, enjoying this. You're enjoying <laughs> this. <laughs> uh, all right. I've forgotten most of this. OK, <clears throat> on, on Waterloo, uh, another very important publication that he helped um, he, as one of three members, along with uh, Dan Moran and, and Greg Pedlow, translated and edited um, a, um, you know, Clausewitz interpretation of the, the Battle of Waterloo. Um, this, um, this work really is important for understanding how the, the battle was understood in the, in the context of its time. Um, finally, Dr. Basford is the webmaster um, of the Clausewitz homepage. It's a web-based effort to collect and dispense high-quality research and analysis on Clausewitz, and it's been online since 1995. Yeah, it's one of the oldest websites on the web. There are which two is curious, isn't it? Two, two particular assets I would highlight. Uh, one is the uh, valuable word index to our volume, the Pere and, and Howard volume of On War, and two, interestingly, the, the frequently asked questions. They're really interesting questions that that uh, that you highlight. So if you want to start. You know, you can imagine the web traffic that comes into that page. Uh, he has a page devoted to the essential questions. Why is he so famous? Uh, why are people still so interested in his ideas today? And why are Clausewitz's ideas so controversial? And these are very succinct, you know, several paragraph essays on um, that are informative and succinct and valuable. They kind of give an introduction to, to Clausewitz. So with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Basford who will lead our discussion this week with particular emphasis on purpose and means in war. Oh, thank well, thank you. I'm, I'm much more impressive than I had realized. I <laughs> had no idea. You know, the Cohen piece cost me 50 bucks. I guess I probably owe you more uh, uh, than that. Uh, well, when Lisa asked me to uh, come in and talk, she really very le much left my choice of subject uh, up to me, um, the dangerous thing to do. Uh, and that's difficult because Clausewitz is a really interesting guy. He's interesting in a lot of different ways to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but what really struck me, um, something that's really 
been burned into my mind for a long time. Uh, back in, uh, must have been August 2003, I was on the faculty at the War College uh, out across the river. And um, we had a faculty get together, 60 faculty members sitting around the, the table. And our Army faculty, three very bright, highly experienced uh, Army colonels, uh, I think two of them had PhDs, and uh, you know, these were genuinely very impressive people, decided that they were going to um, bring us up to speed. Uh, visions of Peter Sellers should be running through your head. Um, bring us up to speed on what was going on in Iraq. And the lead speaker got up and he said, uh, the first words out of his mouth, next slide, were, well, as you know, our objectives in Iraq have been quite limited. It's the only thing I remember from the pitch. I was probably unconscious from that moment on. <laughs> uh, somebody probably helped me get back up, uh, you know, gave me water or smelling salt. Uh, yes, yes, our objectives in Iraq were quite limited. We were going to invade this country, occupy all of it, totally eliminate its military forces. The people that we don't kill, we're going to fire it out in the streets, leave without a job or pensions. Uh, the ruling dynasty will be killed. There's never any question that Saddam was going to die when his sons were killed. Uh, we're going to take the ruling party and throw it out in the street and deprive it of all political influence. We're going to take the ruling class and subordinate it to a different religio-ethnic group that hasn't held power in that region of the world for a thousand years. Um, uh, we're going to completely upturn, overturn their social, political, economic, legal systems. Yeah, it's pretty limited. <laughs> um, and you know, I, yeah, yeah, I was a little stunned, right? And, you know, I did some digging, some market research on this. It's a typical attitude. That was, that was the thinking. Right? So it should come as no surprise that things didn't work out the way we thought they were uh, going to work out. Next slide. Now, when Clausewitz says, the first, the supreme, the most far-reaching act of judgment that strategists make, is to understand the kind of war that they are undertaking. Uh, you know, this is the this, this is the first of all strategic questions. Um, it all comes down to objectives and the relationship between political and military objectives. And the language that we use um, to describe this, uh, the language of total war and limited war, <coughs> is not what Clausewitz was talking about, but it's in the ballpark. And it's an effort, that language, those terms are efforts to get at Clausewitz's theoretical model. But I don't think that we're there. I just don't think that uh, uh, this is common, a common part of our culture. And if I'm wrong at the end of this pitch, let me know, because I'd really like to find out that I'm wrong. Um, so next slide. Here's where I'm going, this two by two uh, matrix on the, uh, on the right. Uh, it's a very simple model. It's your typical you know, uh, beltway banded uh, victory machine. Um, but it's the simplest way of uh, breaking into Clausewitz's thinking on this, this issue. And I don't think it's the most important subject in on war. There are a lot of issues in on war. But it is the most important concept from the standpoint of strategic analysis. And Fossus is a lot more than a strategic analyst. When you think about what motivates people to study Clausewitz, uh, you had Alan Byershin here a couple weeks ago. Alan's a historian of science, German science, and Alan really understands the math. You know, most science historians who say they understand, they, took, you know, they, they are mathematically based researchers, took a statistics course once. Alan really understands the math of quantum theory and relativity, uh, nonlinear science. Um, and that was his entry into Clausewitz. And his first big splash in Clausewitz studies is a, is a magnificent article on uh, the mathematical and uh, scientific implications of Clausewitz's work. All right. Peter Pere, from whom you will hear later, um, I don't know how he's selling himself these days, but Peter Pere is not a military historian. He 
he's written some great military history, but Peter's always billed himself as an historian of aesthetics. And he's an art historian. Uh, and he's particularly interested, you know, in aesthetics, the history of thoughts and you know, of feelings and emotions, and that's a very important motive behind his his study of Thomas. It's the psychology, the human nature aspects of of Thomas. There are a lot of different aspects, but this this is the center. That subject, that model, uh, is the center central issue in his uh, Thomas's approach to strategic analysis. Right. Clausewitz would be horrified by that graphic. Clausewitz uh, um, is, uh, uh, you know, he wants to weave together a lot of important concepts, and here I am ripping one out for, uh, you know, for dissection. Um, but you got to start somewhere, and I think it's a very useful uh, way to break in. In any case, the graphics that I use, the language that I use, are taken out of military doctrine, or they were written into military doctrine. I wrote it, so I know. Um, and you can find the, you know, the an older version of my my discussion in uh, MCDP 1-1 strategy and 1-2 uh, campaigning. Uh, and I've given you the links, and I've also given you the 83 slide version of this pitch, which I cut down to 15 for your uh, and sheer consideration for your. Time and I don't have two days to do this. Um, next slide. Now, there's a lot of confusion about Thomas and who he is and what he stood for. Um, Liddell Hart always called him in public the apostle of total war. Right? And he has another op uh, completely opposite reputation as you know the, the great strategist of limited war uh, theory. And as I say, the terms limited war and total war are misleading. Thomas doesn't use those terms. He particularly doesn't use the term total war. The phrase total war appears one time in On War, in a sentence that goes, even if war were total, and the implication is that it is not. But at least those terms get us into the ballpark of what we want to talk about. Uh, so he's you know, either this, this uh, bloody-minded German bastard been on world conquest, total war, or he's this academic uh, analyst, uh, you know, talking about limited war. Uh, Isaiah Berlin had a, a, wrote an article uh, in which he talked about hedgehogs and foxes. And, you know, the hedgehog is a guy who knows one big idea and, you know, really works that one big idea. And the fox is a guy who knows a whole bunch of different ideas and just picks them, you know, you know whichever is useful at a given moment. And that hedgehog fox model has often been given, often been applied to Clausewitz, and he always ends up being a hedgehog. And I've never been able to figure that out. I'm always stunned when I say, I'm obviously easily stunned. Um, because Clausewitz isn't a hedgehog, he doesn't know one big idea. He has a whole bunch of really big ideas. He is a theorist of total war or something in that ballpark. He is a theorist of what we talk about when we say limited war. But he understands how those two things fit together. He's not trying to sell you one or the other. He is a theorist of war. War as it really occurs in the real world. The messy, sloppy, endlessly varied uh, phenomenon that we wrestle with, you guys wrestle with in this building every day. Right? Um, and how that, how that comes down to one big idea and a hedgehog, I, I've never been able to understand. Uh, next slide. Um, I just throw these up, uh, these maps of the Korean War. Does that look like limited war to you? Right. Korea is the classic limited war in American history. It's the event that allegedly introduces us to the notion of limited war. Uh, if you think of the Korean War as a limited war, you will never understand the Korean War. Um, the invasion of Panama. Now, if I, somebody was to say to you, Panama was total war. I think you'd probably roll your eyes. And yet, Pan the American invasion of Panama is a classic demonstration of uh, Clausewitz's high end of the, of the military spectrum. I'll, I'll show you why that is. Is it total war? No, it, it isn't. Uh, total war is a phrase that comes out of World War 
One, coined by German, the German generals who took over the German state, elbowed the civilian government, the, the Kaiser, aside, and ran uh, Germany. And those guys explicitly said, all these theories of Clausewitz need to go out the window. And they knew what they were talking about, too. Uh, because we are going to completely subordinate politics to the pursuit of military victory, which Clausewitz, I mean, Clausewitz was probably doing at 6,000 RPM in his grave uh, at that point. Uh, but as I say, at least the terms total war and limited war get us into the ballpark of what Clausewitz was talking about. Uh, and it's a good place to start. Next slide. Um, the two major sources of confusion about on war, um, you know, Clausewitz made two big errors in his life, uh, crucial errors that we should uh, beat up on him for. The first was he kept thinking. Um, most of us don't suffer from that. Uh, we, you know, particularly academics, we come up with one, you know, cool idea that we can actually express, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to sell it. Uh, Clausewitz kept working his his ideas. Clausewitz, if, if there's one phrase that uh, characterizes him as an intellect, it is ruthless intellectual integrity. Right? He'd come up with an idea, uh, and then he would test it. He wrote a lot of uh, campaign studies, a lot of uh, uh, historical studies, like his study of the Waterloo campaign, to test his theories. And when the theories didn't stand up, he changed them. I say that's unusual. Um, his second serious mistake, for which he should be criticized, is he, he picked a bad time to die. All right? Clearly, he never finished the book. But the two things that really confuse us about on war, as you read the book, um, are this. First of all, Clausewitz is a dialectical thinker. Uh, um, dialectic, the dialectic simply means dialogue. It's conversation between ideas. But dialectical approach to writing is not part of the Anglo-Saxon cultural tradition. Right? Uh, when we hear the word dialectic, we usually think of Hegel or Marx. And Clausewitz is not a commie. Right? Um, he probably draws his dialectic thinking. He knows Hegel, but he probably drew it from Plato. Right. Um, and what you do in a dialectical approach is you take an idea, a useful idea, a good idea, about some important subject, and you you work that idea. What does this idea mean? All right. What does it do for us? How does it help us? What does it show us? And then we test it. And if you're really doing your job, you test it to failure. Um, and then you turn to another idea, not necessarily an opposite idea, but a different idea with different entailments, different implications. And you work that the same way. And then that's your antithesis. And then you try to extract all the good ideas from your thesis and antithesis, put them together, lose the bad stuff, and that's your new synthesis, right? Constance uses the words thesis, antithesis, synthesis about a total of five times in the book because it, it's this this approach is so deeply embedded in his cultural context. He doesn't have to tell you what he's doing. He doesn't, his structure is very casual. He doesn't really work this in a terribly formal way, but that's what he is doing. And that's why the book is so confusing to a lot of people, because tell me if you've had this experience. You're reading on war. Uh, he's making an argument. You're reading it. Yeah, this is really clever, but you got it wrong. You know that you know, he's, he's mistaken. And then you turn the page. And he says, but that would be a mistake. <laughs> and it's really irritating because now you thought you were ahead of him, and it turns out he's 150 years ahead of you. It's, it's annoying. Right? But that's how he works. Now, we do the same thing. Right? You know, but we don't trust one writer to, to argue both sides of an issue. Right? When you go to get your master's or PhD, your committee is going to be bitching at you constantly, what's your thesis statement? They're not asking you for an, your antithesis. They're not asking you mostly for the, your synthesis, because this is not our cultural tradition. But that's what Clausewitz is doing, and hey, get, get over it, live with it. It's a really cool approach, and it's really useful, but it's alien to the way we think. But there's, uh, I've got a, a set of uh, Clausewitz's dialectical um, pairs, if you will. The first one there is absolute war or ideal war. They're not the same thing. Um, I think ideal war is a descendant 
of absolute war. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and those are abstractions and the dialectical pair to that, pairing to that is real war. Real war is an interesting term. I, I, I don't know how many academic conferences I've sat at where people are really scratching their heads over what particular slice of military history of our experience of, real, uh, of war in the real world corresponds to Clausewitz's category of real war, right? Because we're interpreting words like ideal war and real war as real good war. And what is Clausewitz saying is, is, is the model. What, what should we follow? The, 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 the concept of real war is probably the simplest idea in on war. It's about war in the real world, the way it really appears, the messy, sloppy, all over the place, unpredictable, but character of war as we actually experience the real war. If it's actually happened in the real world, it's real war. Clausewitz, you know, Clausewitz is a man of enormous practical experience. All right? This guy was in combat from the age of 13. All right? And he worked at the very center of the Prussian state. He's a very young man. I mean, the war's end, he's a colonel in 1815 when Napoleon puts off, you know, takes off the crown for the second time. Uh, Clausewitz is, what, 35 years old. He's a young man, right? but enormous experience at the very center of the Prussian state. He lives in the palace. He's married to the highest ranking non-royal woman in Prussia. And that's where he gets his political expertise. She's his professor of political science. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he's, he's conscious of, of uh, you know, the practical character of war. He's a very practical man, right? With enormous experiences as a practical planner. Right? Um, he's not interested in theory for his own sake. Right? He's, he's very much got both feet planted in the real world. Um, and real war is what he's really interested in. Another dialectical pair, obvious, you know, you, it's, you, it's very hard to avoid this, so a lot of people do, and that's offense and defense. They're not mirror images of one another, they are very different things. Um, and then, here's what I want to talk about today. Uh, this spectrum of war that we usually call total war versus limited war. Clausewitz's right. his own terms are war of limited objectives and war to leave our opponent politically or militarily helpless or impotent. Right. And I've given you an acronym uh, for that uh, since this is the Pentagon. Yeah, that's right. Right. Can you pronounce it though? It's Pentagon, you have to make it into a word. Mm -hmm. Well, in German, that'd be Wittlop. Wittlopum. And it, just, just use the acronym. Everybody will know what you're talking okay. about. <laughs> uh, now, those terms are, of course, a subject of uh, the uh, sources of this total war idea. Total war sounds like absolute war. Sounds like, you know, a war to leave your opponent helpless. And there are connections. Uh, you know, the, the, there's certainly overlap, but the notion of total war, as Liddell Hart meant it, uh, as the German generals of World War One meant it, um, is not does not come from Clausewitz and is, is antithetical to Clausewitz. Right? Total war means the, the pursuit of total military victory, which we do do. Right? We score total military victory. Right? Uh, is it Ludendorff you're citing? Ludendorff. Yeah, Eric Ludendorff. Um, uh, we do this, uh, I mean, that is to say, we, we, we pursue the kind of war Clausewitz describes, but we never subordinate politics to the pursuit of military victory. Uh, we, an idea that Clausewitz thought was insane. Uh, so, so if, if somebody says to you that Clausewitz is a total war theorist, you should just go ahead and slap them. Unless they're the secretary, only secretary, which I, I would advise you. They do it twice, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the truth is that everything is a continuation of politics uh, by other means. And, you know. Next slide. Uh, but a lot of confusion with on war stems from Clausewitz's intellectual evolution. Uh, on war is, uh, you know, when Clausewitz dies, or actually when he goes off to serve as uh, chief of staff to the only army that Prussia puts into the field in the crisis of 1830. Right. Um, he leaves his manuscripts in a stack 
Uh, and uh, those manuscripts date from like, 1816 to 1830. And his wife, Marie, <coughs> and her brother, uh, edit his books. You know, his, his, his collected works are 10 volumes, right? On Wars, three volumes of those. Um, Marie is intimately familiar with his thinking uh, and has worked with him, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's a really tremendous intellectual partnership between he and his wife. But she does not attempt to bring all of those different essays written at different times into coherence with one another. Uh, she simply edits them, puts them in more or less in an order, the order that Clausewitz was thinking about, uh, and, and publishes them. Uh, and so when you read on more, you are reading uh, Clausewitz is thinking from various, I mean, over you know, a decade and a half, a very engaged, very active intellectual evolution. And so you'll be reading, a, you know, Clausewitz. You know the Clausewitz brothers, you know, several of them at different stages of their of their intellectual evolution, and unfortunately, the book is not organized in the order in which Clausewitz wrote it. So the latest section of the book, the most recently written, is probably book one. Well, it's definitely book one, and then closely followed by book seven and eight, and then all the stuff in between. You know, from, you know, it's it's a real hodgepodge in terms of where he was in his evolution. And I still find the book tremendously coherent because the problems, the issues that were driving his evolution are clearly there and he's wrestling with them. But he changes his terminology, he changes his conceptual perspective over the course of writing the book and never gets a chance to impose that uh, uniformity uh, you know, of his latest thinking on, on the whole book. And you just need to be aware of that as you read it. Um, so I've simplified it down to Clausewitz version 1 and Clausewitz version 2. In Clausewitz version 1, uh, war is one thing. You, know, you go to war, everybody knows what you're doing, it's, it's war. War is one thing, and yeah, we know that it varies a great deal, but the sources of those variations are basically the competence and intensity with which it is pursued. It's one thing. So you get wars that, you know, from, you know, a war of uh, observation where two armies stand on opposite sides of the borders and make faces at each other, up to wars in which one, uh, one side gets wiped out. Um, and uh, that certainly, you know, that, that describes a spectrum of real war. Um, and this notion of absolute war, uh, a term he uses, uh, is the high end of real war. It's war at its most energetic and most competent, but, uh, and it is actually accomplished. Napoleon, wa you know, he sometimes he will say, Napoleon waged absolute war. Right? Napoleon was certainly very good at it. And Napoleon ends up on a little island in the South Atlantic. Right. Um, but absolute war is inside the, the bounds of real war. It actually occurs in the real world. But Clausewitz keeps thinking. Uh, really, it's annoying. And he begins to feel, to think, you know, it isn't one thing. War um, actually has two uh, sources, uh, two, today we'd say attractors. Uh, poles. Uh, Alan Byerson would have thrown this, this image up probably had he used slides. Uh, that is a Lorentzian strange attractor. If you're familiar with complexity theory and nonlinear mathematics, war has two attractors, two, two tendencies that exist simultaneously. And of, uh, often, you know, it's both are going on at the same time. I mean, somebody's, you know, one side's waging a war of limited objectives and the other side is waging total war, if, if you want to use that offhand phrase that I don't like very much. Right? And that's, that's a big change in his thinking. Uh, and now the, the, the notion of absolute war, this, this absolute peak of war, moves out of the range of real war and becomes the philosophical abstraction of ideal war 
that we read in, in book one, chapter one. And you know, that chapter, I say 90% of people who try to read on war never make it through that chapter. They are stopped dead by that highly abstract discussion of ideal war. Right? They stop dead for one of two reasons. Either they just, I can't handle it, I can't deal with this, this is too crazy, this is too deep, too thick, I use this. Right? Or people start thinking, oh, I see what he's getting at. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolute war, total war, yeah, kill them all. Um, and that's a serious mistake. Because at the end of the chapter, he says, and that would be crazy. We don't actually do this. <laughs> um, in the real world, a war looks like X. And he, he takes you to his synthesis of, of, of war. You know, uh, his thesis is war is something but an act of force to you know, compel our enemy to do our will. His antithesis is war is nothing but an act of conscious, rational policy. And his synthesis is the trinity, which says war is this dynamic and unpredictable interaction between the forces of uh, violent emotion, uh, rational calculation, and sheer bloody chance. That's the trinity. It's not people, army, government. I'm sorry, army guys. It is, it is uh, emotion, rationality, and chance. Uh, so in this Plowsfits 2.0, uh, Ideal war is outside the range of uh, uh, of real of real war of war that happens in the real world, and that argument has confused readers of on war for a century, um, and uh, you just need to work through it. You have to actually have to read it. I'm sorry, you have to read it to understand. Next slide. Uh, the word limited. What's being limited? Uh, what's being limited is our political objectives, and particularly our military, obje our military and political objective with regard to the opponent that we face. All right. Now, when you say that our objectives in Iraq were limited, why would you say that? Well, I think the thinking is, well, we weren't trying to conquer the world. We were just trying to conquer Iraq. Well, yeah, but you said our objectives in Iraq. Right? And in fact, we were trying to conquer a lot more than Iraq. I mean, the, the, insofar as there was any, uh, you know, grand strategic notion there, this, this, we were going to change the whole Middle East. Right? Um, but the issue is, what are you trying to do politically and militarily, these are different things, to your opponent? Right? Our motives, it's not a description of our motives. It's not a description of the means we use. All right? Now, if I asked you, was uh, the, the invasion of Panama a limited war? You'd probably say yes. We didn't use nukes. In fact, we didn't even break a sweat. Right? Um, but in fact, we are talking about the high end, uh, the classes. Uh, objectives are unilateral. All right? I have my objectives, you have yours. Right? Uh, the enemy has his. But wars are not unilateral. Right? Wars are, by definition, I mean, they're not fighting back, they ain't a war. Right? So there's a problem with the way we use war, and Klaus does this too. Oftentimes he uses the word war as something that we are doing. We are waging war of limited objectives. Yeah, but what's the other guy doing? And you can't ca categorize a war as limited when in fact a lot of the players are not waging limited war. Yes, our objectives are limited, but his aren't. Or more often, our objectives aren't limited, and his are. Right. Next slide. So, this is a, a, a figure from MCDP 1-1. One right. And I hate to just throw this thing on the, on the board, on the screen. The right way to do this is to start with a blank screen draw a line on it, say low, high, uh, on either end, and start building it in a conversation with your students. All right? Give me an example of a low-end political objective that might lead to war, something I'm trying to impose on my opponent that might, might lead to war. And uh, people will give me various answers. I'm in control of, of the marker. I will rephrase it. 
uh, and put it where I want on the screen. And they will object. And we will have an argument about it. And we all learn a whole lot. Right? Um, but we, I want to build a spectrum uh, of political objectives. Right? And I can't see that from here, but as I recall, that starts with uh, uh, just simply intimidate and works its way up through, say, change, take, take a slice of territory on over into the change regime uh, uh, you know, area, then on up to genocide and extermination. It's kind of an odd thing to put on a, in an American doctrinal publication, but we're not just talking about us, we're talking about everybody. And we've done genocide, by the way. Uh, so, uh, I build a spectrum, uh, and there's nothing magic about these terms, uh, the specific uh, terms I use, and some of them are, are dangerous. That, that uh, line there, uh, take a slice of territory. Well, that's a very tricky business, historically. I mean, a lot of times in history, territory populations are fungible. Okay, I can give up, you know, this part of Europe if, uh, if you give me this part of Europe, you know. And I don't care if these guys are paying taxes to you, as long as I'm getting taxes from these guys over here. But once nationalism hits the fan in Europe, um, taking a slice of territory is no longer a limited objective because it's seen through the eyes of nationalism as an unlimited attack on the nation. You try to seize a little slice of France and you're in World War I and World War II. Uh, somebody tries to seize a slice of Texas, well, I personally am willing to give up Texas, but I, uh, uh, yeah, you, you see I'm getting at. These things change over time. Right? And regime change, what does that mean? It's a phrase we use all the time. But what do we want to change? We want to change out one guy? We want to change out the, the ruling party? We want to change out the ruling class? We want to change out the whole population? You know, we want to conquer it and absorb it into our state, our empire, our alliance system? Or we just want to kill everybody and take the land? Um, that's, that's a spectrum. And then I ask, all right, if you were going to break this into two chunks, if you were going to organize this into a taxonomy, where would you break it? And, you know, I've got the line survival there. Right. At what point does our success, you know, if we have an objective, uh, and if we achieve that objective, and you can survive, my opponent can survive, you can remain, you know, the, the grand coup of Tomania uh, after I win this war. Um, then uh, I, I would say that we are on the limited side of the spectrum. But if you're not going to survive, if the opposing leadership is going to be gone as a consequence of my victory, of my success, well, that's a different ball game, isn't it? Right. Now, the real issue here isn't survival. The real issue is, am I going to provoke my opponent to maximum resistance? Or is, is my objective one that ultimately he can live with? He doesn't want to live with it, but he can, he, something he can accept. Right? Um, now, there's a real problem with this, because a lot of times what we think we're asking for, I'm not, I'm not saying we as Americans, but we as you know, human beings, what we think we're asking for is pretty limited. Right? Hey, I, I, I only want this little slice of territory. I only want... Uh, you to change your policy. Quit, quit expelling your Albanians, right? Um, but the way it's perceived on the other side is quite different. Uh, Mr. You know, Uncle Sam, if you don't understand. If I give you what you want, this thing you think is a limited objective, I'll be a dead man. My own people will kill me. My colleagues will overthrow me. Or if you, I let you weaken me this way, my neighbors will cut me. Uh, a classic example, uh, I love this. Uh, during the uh, Bosnian War, um, in, uh, uh, when, uh, you know, we were bombing the Serbs. What do we want? Uh, we don't have a dog in this fight. We don't really care how the war comes out. We don't care what the map looks like. We just want it to stop. Because our objective is the preservation of NATO. Right. We start bombing the Serbs, 
we're bombing their what we call their center of gravity. It's their conventional equipment. That's their advantage over the Croats, uh, Croats, and the uh, and the uh, Bosnian. Right? And our objective is to get the Serbs to negotiate. Well, the Serbs know we're not going to wipe them out. They know our objectives are limited. We're not going to pay the price uh, in you know public relations if. Uh, of, of killing enough Serbs to really uh, uh, win the war. But if we keep bombing their tanks and, and artillery, at some point they lose their military advantage and the Croats, and particularly the Bosnians, who have a huge manpower advantage, will annihilate them. So we leverage that, uh, that fear of their own annihilation to get a negotiated solution. Um, because the, the, you know, it's not us who's going to whack them; it's the Croats or the Bosnians who will whack them. So, building this this spectrum is, is really important, uh, and it should be done over the course of a couple of weeks of, of, of you know arguing it out, because we all have terminological and conceptual uh, um, um, differences that have to be thrashed out. They can't. Just throwing up on the screen doesn't do the job. Next screen. Can you do the same thing for military objectives? Say, so, yeah, you can. All right. Um, uh, let me do this down and dirty. If I'm a mugger and you have a wallet, I want what's in your wallet. My objective is to get the cash. My instrument is a screwdriver. All right. And, um, you know, I'm thinking. All I need to do is wave the screwdriver around and demand the money, and you will give it to me. Because it's, you know, who wants to be stuck with a screwdriver or, 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 or kill for 50 bucks or 100 bucks, right? Uh, so I can, I can use force to inflict pain and stress in order to get you to decide to give me your wallet. Right? I can, I, I'm going after your will, right? You are going to decide to end the, this struggle and give me what I want because I'm inflicting pain or stress or fear. Right? Or I can simply kill you right? and take the wallet. In that case, I'm going after your capacity to resist. Right? Very different objectives. Right? And of course, the situation really complicates things. Yeah, nobody's going to die defending 50 bucks in, in a wallet. They're just going to give you the 50 bucks, right? Well, this guy's seven feet tall, but he outweighs me by 50 pounds, and he doesn't think I can, I can pull this off. He'll resist. Some people are just jerks and will fight to the bitter end just on principle. The guy probably deserves to get stabbed with a screwdriver. <laughs> right? But maybe the guy, you know, what else is in that wallet? The last photograph of his di dead daughter is in that wallet. You don't know that. And you're really puzzled. Why is he resisting so hard? Uh, well, maybe you need to get inside the guy's head. How much did we know about the Vietnamese when we went to war with Vietnam? How much did we know about Iraq when we uh, got ourselves, uh, got our ties caught in that ring? Uh, uh, but this difference between attacking the enemy's will and getting him to make a deal, he's making a decision. To make a deal. Or going after his capacity, you're making him irrelevant. He no longer has capacity to resist. He's, he, we're making him into a bystander. These are fundamental differences, and this is what Clausewitz is getting at. And you say, well, that's too simple. But there has to be more to it. Well, of course there is. But at the end of the war, if you have not worn down, eroded your opponent's will to resist, or you have not removed his capacity, and you have not removed his capacity to resist, you have lost, right? This way of looking at it is, is very powerful. The problem is the words that we use. War is extremely emotional. It's not a rational exercise. And the words we use to describe our ideas in war are, have all kinds of emotional baggage associated with it. I'm, I'm speaking to you now as a doctrine writer. Right? We went through all kinds of words trying to describe this approach to war. Uh, the classical word 
for the high end is annihilation. I can't use that word. It is inter immediately reinterpreted as extermination. Annihilation means making something into nothing. I don't mean the dogs and the cats and the, and, and the, and the little children. I mean making the enemy's military capacity, their ability to resist, to continue the struggle, into nothing. It is eliminating. That's annihilation. You can't use the word. It won't work. On the other end of the spectrum, we couldn't use the word attrition, which is the traditional term. You say attrition to a Marine, and he immediately said it brings up, uh, because they're mostly from the South, they, they bring up uh, the, the Eastern Theater of the American Civil War, they bring up the Western Front in World War I, they bring up search and destroy uh, uh, missions in Vietnam. They will not accept attrition as a label for a legitimate military objective. Um, Bob Pape came up with these words, coercion and compellence. If you, I don't know if you all remember uh, Bob Pape's model. And this was very influential on PME. The problem is, uh, you know, Bob was looking for two neutral words that don't have a lot of emotion associated with them. The problem is those two neutral words mean the same damn thing. And nobody could ever get a straight, you know, coercion, com which, which is what, like, go into dictionary, coercion, see compellent. So it, it, it didn't work. Clausewitz's own term for this is disarm. To disarm the enemy, to take away his arms. That didn't work either. People, were, the response was, wait, we're going to negotiate an arms control treaty with these, these guys? You're going to negotiate an arms control treaty with Hitler? What? We couldn't get beyond that because, you know, people don't read doctrine. You know, the, the, you know some people do. They're strange folks. Uh, but the broader doctrinal debate turns on the buzzwords. And picking the right buzzword is, is really crucial. Army of excellence, I remember, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm old, I remember that. Right? What Shaimar meant by army of excellence was interpreted as uh, uh, you know, an army in which you better not fail. Right? Which is not, absolutely not what Shaimar was getting at. Right? Um, so, Klausowitz himself, uses the word overthrow for a while, and then I think he concludes that overthrow sounds political. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about military uh, annihilation. I'm talking about the destruction of the enemy's ability to resist. Right. But those are your two objectives. It all comes down to that. You're using military force either to inflict pain and stress in order to target the enemy's will to continue the struggle, and the enemy will at some point decide to give you what you want, or you are going after his capacity to resist, and at some point, he becomes irrelevant. His will becomes irrelevant. Now, next slide. Those things are very hard to distinguish from one another in reality. And the classic military uh, uh, demonstration of this issue is Monty Python's uh, Quest for the Holy Grail, the Black Knight scene. All right? You watch that, and you get, I'm not going to show it. Um, next, next slide. Now, here's, here's the real complexity. If we're going after unlimited political objectives, well, I guess we must use high-end unlimited military objectives, right? Uh, and there's some truth to that in that if, if what you're calling for is something that leads to the enemy's downfall, He's not going to survive your victory. Well, remember that people don't get tired of living. Politicians will always fight to the last soldier to preserve their job or their power, their influence. Right? So you can't wear down their will to survive. So you go after their capacity. But on the limited political objective side, you can use either approach. It depends on the circumstances. Um, Annihilation is always the best objective. It's the easiest one-size-fits-all strategy because, as I say, if you remove their capacity to resist, their will is irrelevant. But it's expensive. It is very costly, particularly if you're dealing with somebody who actually has the power to fight back. Annihilation is a very expensive objective. So you have to think this through. Next slide. So we end up with this two by two. And there's only two moving parts in it, but 
the fact is, it, it, it sounds it sounds counterintuitive, but Alan Barshin can explain this to you in mathematical terms. You can create an enormous amount of complexity with two moving parts. Right. And um, this box, this little tool, uh, is a great way to break into um, any given situation. Um, and I, I, frankly, I'm embarrassed by this graphic because it is so simple, and the world is not a simple place. But it's a very powerful tool. All right? And it turns on, I, I've either got limited or I say high end or unlimited, if you will. Consulates doesn't use the term unlimited. Um, <coughs> objectives on the political side, and then you have either limited or unlimited objectives on the military side. And depending on where that combination of objectives falls, what box are you in? Now, when we first came up with this thing, we, the, the lower left hand box is black. Um, we, at, in the wake of Vietnam, we simply couldn't figure out a way that you could use limited objectives, military objectives, uh, in pursuit of high end political objectives. But in fact, you can, and it's containment. And it works because containment is pure defense, in a sense, but you do have high-end objectives. You're looking for a, a transformation in your opponent. You're waiting. You're using military force to defend yourself. But your real offensive instrument is not military. It's political, economic, cultural. What brought the Soviet Union down? What will eventually change Iran? What will eventually change uh, North Korea? These are states that it's simply too expensive for us to go after them militarily. But our objectives politically are very high end, uh, indeed. So, next slide. And say so this is a set of examples uh, uh, of, of each of these uh, categories. And I just want to use that to point out some complexities. Uh, and I will end it. Uh, the, the 60 minute mark, and I'm told that we'll have a chance to talk about this during lunch. Um, this is not meant as a victory machine. All right? This is not a black box that produces your answer. It's an analytical tool. And it's not meant to simplify the world. The world is a complex place. But it's meant to allow you to break into complexity in a way that doesn't, isn't sheer confusion. Uh, and these examples um, are a lot of fun to play with. You know, Napoleon invades Russia in 1812 with 700,000 men. The war ends with Napoleon's near total destruction. He gets back to Paris with still like 1,600 men. I mean, it's awesome. Sounds like total war. And yet, Napoleon's political objectives are very limited. He's not trying to conquer Russia. He's trying to get the czar to agree to cooperate with the economic strategy that he is pursuing against his, his true enemy, his great enemy, Great Britain. And uh, the Russians agree to do that, and then they start smuggling. It's so strange, the Russians cheating on a deal. <laughs> um, and his purpose is simply to force the czar back into compliance with the continental system against Great Britain. But he chooses to go after it by the destroying the, Prussia, the Russian army. Uh, and he fails. But that's his strategy. In 1870, the, the Germans, uh, to put it simply, it's a lot more complex than that, the Germans have a very limited political objective vis-a-vis -vis France. They want the French to butt out of German politics. They don't want anything from France. All they want is for the French to stay out of German politics while Prussia unifies Germany. Right? But in order to do that, they have to neutralize the French army, and they do. They totally capture the entire French professional army uh, and are able to unify Germany because the French can't interfere. But they didn't expect the French government to collapse, be overthrown by rep two revolutionary governments, which create new armies and start waging an unlimited war against Prussia. There's interesting complexity. You can win too much. 
each of those examples contains some kind of complexion. But the simple model helps you break into that complexion. And that's its purpose. And I'm finished. Let me say thank you. Um, I would suggest we do this. I have to go see the Deputy Secretary a minute to go. So I'm going to step out and leave you in the capable hands of our Army historian. I'm sure we have time for some questions here, and then you're going to retire to lunch as well. So I'll leave it in your hands to, uh, to uh, carry the rest of the day. And one thing for me, a piece of business, what I might suggest is we have a few weeks here before we have, I think, our next speaker coming in on next, this. Yes, next week? Next Thursday. And then okay. So during that break, perhaps we'll have another one of these. I'll bring pizza, and we can just talk among ourselves about the readings, kind of what we've learned about it, um, and go from there, because um, that would be a value to me. So we'll send out a missive to that effect. So uh, stay tuned for Major Winnegar to be in touch. Thank you for coming here. Terrific thank discussion. You. And uh, I'm sorry I have to step out here, but I'll leave you in good hands. So, all right, thank you guys. As well. yeah, stay seated, everybody, please. It's an advantage to being slow. Don't overreact. Okay. So again, those others that need to leave, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna have a few questions. I imagine there are some questions. We have a very narrow and focused discussion today. Um, start off. Yeah, I've got one in, in your chart. I, mean, I understand it's trying to simplify, and you've got perhaps 80 more slides or whatever that are hidden. But as you spoke about earlier, two different slides may not be, you know, have to be in the same place in the box, and you can characterize. They always the never are. Well, right, but you characterize in the slide the antagonist. I guess you're trying to put a single description of it. So I'm curious. Well, it's not a description of the war. Okay. It's a description of one side's objectives. Okay, and so uh, see, the, see the label is objectives. And the objectives are unilateral. Well, I understand that you have two antagonists. In each I understand. Form, so I'm trying to say, I'm trying to ask, are you talking about the first one, the second one? Well, each, each of those examples says the U.S in v versus the UK. It doesn't, it's not describing the US and the UK, it's only describing the US okay. objective. See, that's the, that's the point. If you want, you, you need to build this box for every player. That's really important. You say this isn't, uh, 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 war is not unilateral. And we often talk about it as, you know, the, people say, Klaus has said war is continuation of policy by the means. Policy is unilateral. That means that war is a way for us to get you to do what we want. Uh-uh. War is a continuation of politics. War is an instrument of politics. Not, uh, you know, military force is an instrument of policy. I'm going to use this thing to club you over the head with. All right? War is an instrument of politics like a courtroom is an instrument of litigation, like a basketball court is an instrument of sports. It's a place in which you battle it out and it's interaction, right? And it, it's, you, you raise a really important issue, and that is uh, that this thing is only about the objectives of one side, and you have to build that box for all sides and figure out the interaction. Now, I do have in that list of, uh, and, and you know, you can do this for any, any war. Right, perhaps I was confused by examples. And yeah, my fault, or friends. yeah, um, I say I, I can only I can only preempt, but so many great objections. Um, where I was trying to get at yeah. is if you noticed it, as the two sides put themselves in different places in this box, mm -hmm. there are structural relationships that you see between those two. So if one is saying the upper right hand quadrant, one is in the left, then it faces conflicts with these characteristics. Or well. Yeah, I, I played with doing that, but you know, there's so many other factors at work. I mean, uh, if uh, you know you're in one block and the, your opponent is in another block, and that's very common. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's important. But you know, you're ten feet tall and he's three feet tall. That's important. Um, he has allies and you don't. That's important. I mean, there's all kinds of factors at work. So say this is only a, a way to break into the complexity of a problem. It leads you to all sorts of other questions. But it also forces you to ask about both sides and how they interact. Now Vietnam is a really interesting example because when we were trying to write this document, we were working in the shadow of Vietnam. That was the dominant military model in our minds, even though we were post Gulf War. Vietnam did not leave our minds just because because uh, of the Gulf War. 
And um, in the Vietnam War, first of all, um, there are a lot of players in there. Um, the North is waging a war of uh, conquest. They're on the high end politically, they're on the high end militarily. Their objective is to take over the South, incorporate it, you know, eliminate the government, and incorporate it into Vietnam, a unified Vietnam. And in order to do that, obviously, they have to strip away completely the military shield of the Southern government. Right? Now, the Southern government would like to do the same thing to the North, but you know, it's completely outside the bounds of reality for them to think about doing that. And they're still trying to leverage us to do it, but we won't do that. We're not willing to pay the price. We are trying to convince the North Vietnamese to stop their aggression against South Vietnam. North Vietnam does not think of, there is no South Vietnam. There's only Vietnam. We are a bunch of nationalists. Our whole reason for being, our justification for existing politically, is that we stand for the Vietnamese people. Right? And for us to accept your objective means the destruction of our ideology. Right? You are asking us to get tired of living politically. Because if we give up the objective of unified Vietnam, if we accept the permanent existence of a South Vietnam dominated by Western imperialists, right, then we are dead. That's a total betrayal of what we stand for. And we cannot do it. Right? Political movements, but governments, political leadership does not get tired of living. And we were asking them to stop living for our convenience and we were never willing to pay the price. We were never willing to do what it would take to convince, well, you couldn't convince them to stop. You would had to make them stop. Destroy their capacity to wage war. And we could not and would not do that. Now, at the same time that we are waging limited war against North Vietnam, we are waging unlimited war against the Viet Cong in the South. We're going to put them out of business. And things like the Phoenix program and the response to Tet are really high end. We are out to wipe them out. Right? Uh, so you have to take all those different uh, objectives and the way they interact into account. And this model, this approach, is an effort to force you to do that. Right? Um, and we resist. We we want to see war as a continuation of our policy by the mean. Right. And that's a real trap. So if you have time, work through those examples. Realize that each of those is a, is a unilateral policy objective. Then go back into that chapter I asked you to read. It's a very short chapter. It's about nine pages, which I find very confusing. How many of you all found that chapter? How many of you all read that chapter? Find it confusing, or was it pretty clear to you? That's a trick question. Nobody wants to admit it was confusing. Right? I have a couple questions for you. I think it's it's pretty neat, right? Could you yeah, identify was, yourself for Professor? Oh, <coughs> he's on Abdul Mutakalim uh, with the Navy staff uh -huh. working in cyber. Uh, this isn't really cyber related, but war I think is war, right? So, uh, you know, what you laid out was really interesting to me. So it, it, it seems neat, and I had a couple questions that it, that it brought up, which was. Do you think that war becomes unlimited if it produces or causes the enemy or causes the opponent to, to then hold the position of, of producing maximum resistance, right? And then the following question would be, do you think it's the shift or this shift in the opponent's desire or will to resist that causes war to become escalated, uh, basically that escalates war into an unlimited state? Well, if I'm asking something from you, my enemy, right. that uh, you just really do not want to give me, um, you will resist. Uh, every dictator, every everybody, I mean, every elected person will try to convince his people that this is a war of survival. Right? I mean, Hitler had to do that. Hitler you know, spent a lot of money on, on propaganda with his own people. 
to try and get them to maximum resistance. Yeah, to get, to get, the, to get them to maximum resistance. Well, that, that didn't take a whole lot because the Allies had already convinced them, <clears throat> had already helped convince them after World War One that they had no interest in the German people in the first place. Well, I mean, remember, millions of Germans starved to death during World War One. <coughs> but, you know, here's, here's a, a surprising uh, factoid, uh, because it, it, it's a very uh, controversial issue, but if you think about World War I, 40 million casualties in World War I, or, you know, uh, uh, 20 million dead civilians and, and, and uh, uh, military. And yet, World War I is really a war of limited objectives. For the most part, um, none of the great powers are pursuing uh, what I would define, or what Clausewitz defined as uh, unlimited uh, political objectives. They are pursuing, uh, in many cases, unlimited military objectives in the sense that they are trying to get total military victory. But once they get it, you know, as, as Mulkey, the elder, said, sure, we could conquer France. What the hell would we do with it? They're French. We can't rule France. Um, so uh, World War I, with 40 million dead, or 40 million casualties, is a limited war. And yet Panama with 500 dead, and that's controversial too, uh, is this high-end war. What are we doing in Panama? Our political objective is unlimited, by Clausewitz's definition. All right? We are going to overthrow the government. All right? we, are going to, we are going to replace Manny Noriega and stick him in a jail cell in, in South Florida. Um, and we are going to totally incapacitate the Panamanian Self-Defense Force. Well, that's Constance's definition of, of uh, he doesn't use the word unlimited because in the real world nothing's unlimited, right? He uses that uh, notion. But he, it is war to render our opponent militarily helpless so that we can impose our political will upon, in this case, our political will is regime change. Whereas in World War I, we just want to beat you and show, show everybody that we can beat you. But uh, we don't care who your government is. <laughs> That's irrelevant. Uh, we're not trying to uh, conquer France. Now, as it happens, they do defeat Russia, the Russian Empire. Uh, most people are unaware of this. The Germans win the war against Russia in World War I. When Hitler marches into, into, Ger into Russia in 1941, we all we said, hey, a fool, invading Russia. It works sometimes. Okay. Uh, the Germans beat Russia and forced the, now the Communist government to sign the Treaty of brest which is basically a surrender. Right? And the only thing that saves uh, Russia is our victory uh, in the West, which nullifies that. But for the most part, the, military, the political objectives of the, of the powers in World War I are very limited. They're not, they're not going out. And yet they're willing to pay an unbelievable price. I know that I've drifted off the, uh, the subject because I'm a drifty guy. But uh, do you have the question? Uh, I, I had a bunch of them, but they were. They <laughs> but I, I, well, I was I was thinking of, of, about cessation of hostilities and, and Clausewitz. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, he specifically says just because hostilities have stopped, that doesn't mean that you've won, and just because you think that you've defeated the army. The enemy army doesn't mean that you've actually won. The results are in every final. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and and it seems like that's true, especially with the situation we find ourselves in. I was I was trying to find an example of where that wasn't true, and the best I could come up with is was just upon, around the point where you mentioned uh, Germany not taking over France. I was thinking about that Germany and France have not actually been fighting each other since 1945. Mm -hmm. and is there is that a unique? Uh, a, a unique, uniquely long period of history. Uh, well, you know, 19, 1815 to 1914 is a period of fundamental peace. I mean, there is no general war. There, there are some pretty sharp little wars, but 1870. 1870. I'd, <coughs> I'd nitpick on that. That's okay. the North German Confederation against <laughs> yeah. France for about a year. Nobody else gets involved. Right. All right. And of course, this is Bismarck's. Uh, you know, nightmare that mm -hmm. other people start getting involved. Yes. That's why he's so eager to end the war quickly. But uh, you have the Crimean War, which is probably the most, the it biggest is. war, mm -hmm. in the sense it's Russia, France, Britain, mm -hmm. Turkey, 
Uh, but again, it doesn't become uh, a Thirty Years' War. It doesn't become no, no, it doesn't. Uh, the Napoleonic War. Uh, it's very contained in in space. Uh, it's fought a little bit in the Baltic and mostly in uh, Crimea. the Crimea, uh, the Black Sea. Um, but 18, 1815, 1914 is a period of general peace. The main reason being that every state in Europe is more focused on the threat of internal revolution than they are on each other. You know, in 1818, the French army invades Spain again. Many of the same troops who fought for Napoleon under the revolution are now invading Spain again in support of the concert of Europe in order to, to uh, support the conservative cause in Europe. Uh, and they're welcome to Syria. Same guys who are being, you know, hanged, drawn, and quartered, murdered by uh, guerrillas in huge numbers are now welcome as, uh, as, as liberator. All right. Political context uh, is everything. But until eight, 1870 or so, all the armies in Europe are much more focused yep. on the fear of inter internal revolution. And the armies are, in fact, used as a means to socialize the, the, the populations of their states into the state. All right. And then there are definitely these huge, very patriotic armies the threat of revolution more or less goes away because the, the states are really doing their jobs and people are pretty happy in the age of progress. And there are these enormous armies that you could only justify through, with you know external threats. And then they turn on one another and the Europeans commit, commit suicide. You know, most people don't, aren't aware because we don't teach them this. In 1848, the German, the Hohenzollerns are driven out of Berlin by revolutionary armies. The Habsburgs are driven out of Vienna by revolutionary armies. Right? Um, only the British and the Russians don't face revolutions in 1848. The Russians, because they've killed the revolutionaries ahead of time, and the Brits, because they've cut a deal with them ahead of time. Uh, and, but other than that, that's the focus. So uh, I'm trying to remember what, what sparked me into that diatribe, but uh, the political context is is crucial here. But yeah, you do have peace, you know, long-standing peace. Uh, of course, people think, a lot of people are arguing now that why did we fight Germany in World War II? They're running things down. Just as we were saying in the 1980s, we didn't defeat Japan, they're kicking our ass. No, you can win a, you can win a war. Francis says you can win a war. But don't delude yourself that history stops. We won the Cold War. The Russians are back. A, new, a different Russia. History rolls on, as uh, who, 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 Frank uh, uh, Fukuyama yes. discovered yes. to his yes. Yes. Okay. Well, on that note, perhaps we should wrap it up with uh, applause for uh, <laughs> Professor Bamford. Uh, appreciate so much your your comments, not just on Clausewitz and his and the taxonomy you create to help understand it, but also your uh, wonderful insights into modern European history, not just how politics can be applied to our current military questions, well, but you, also how we can apply no it to Nobody's European interested history. in understanding Clausewitz. I'm not interested in understanding Clausewitz. I'm interested in understanding war. And if you study Clausewitz, you know, you say Clausewitz is really interesting in and of himself. He really is fascinating. An interesting character, you know, he tells you an awful lot. I mean, I, don't get me going on that. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we were using it to understand the world. And what's really amazing is this guy, this guy who, who achieved uh, room temperature 180 years ago uh, is still so the, the most modern of military theorists. And uh, you know, I, I've tracked his fashionability over the years. Clausewitz is in fashion. Uh, he's out of fashion when you've just won a war. Because right? you know, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Uh, he comes back into fashion, you know, predictably, routinely, when you're not doing so well. Because it, you know, it keeps turning out, even, you know, he, boy, he sure got some cool ideas, and they sure seem relevant to the problems that we face. But if you believe that Clausewitz is a proponent of the offensive, and he's all about conventional state militaries, well, he must be irrelevant to the current war. No, Clausewitz is about the defense, and we're getting our ass kicked by the defense because our enemies are on the defense. 
and we are incapable of acknowledging that our enemies are defending themselves. Right? We also have a hard time with Clausewitz. The defense, what? He's a German. How can he possibly believe that the defense is a stronger form of war? No, I'm not going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I look forward so to talking to you some more. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Paris.